Welcome everyone to the Taproot Root Cause Analysis Podcast, where with each episode we give you insight and ideas into helping you and your company improve uh, in all the things, safety, quality, um, just your human performance all around. And today we have Rick Hulse and Alex Paradise. Welcome. Thanks for having us. We are going to talk about company killers. And that title can be a little, um, put a question mark in your head. What are you talking about exactly? And Alex, uh, give us a little overview of, of that terminology, company killers. So when I, when I think of company killers, I think of things either mistakes, problems, incidents that took out the company. Maybe they went bankrupt. Maybe they, you know, had to change or be bought by another company. Or it's companies like these problems that happened that changed entire industries, Mm -hmm. changed the way that people did work. Um, They were disasters that either broke down an industry or um, basically resulted in major regulation toward that industry. So there's a lot of those little stories out there that you hear um, from, again, environmental disasters, explosions, um, or just different industry-defining moments. I can think of, you know, from an industry-defining moment, we think of the Challenger, oh, right? Yeah, that, that, that's a that's a, an industry-defining moment, and there's a lot of changes that came about because of that disaster. And so those, those moments like that that can be cemented in people's minds and in culture um, are oftentimes company killers. Well, and it can also bring about, um, like, when it's something that deals with our environmental issues, um, it can create a whole nother uh, group of people who come after that industry. Um, so you can have all kinds of bad things happen. It may not just be that your clients go away, but it could be pressures from um, other people. Sure. It takes a long time for a company to recover mm-hmm. from something like that. Yeah. You talk about the changes in regulations that it can drive. You think about the oil spill up in uh, Alaska. Yeah, everybody remembers that. It changed everything. It sure did. Yeah. And, and you know, just thinking environmental disasters, I was reading an article that had, I want to say it was something like either $750 million in EPA fines were not able to be collected because the companies that went through a lot of these environmental disasters went bankrupt. Mm-hmm. The company was sold for parts and the EPA got what it could, but it lost $750 million in fines because that company went under as a result of a, of a disaster. And they don't all go under. They don't. A lot of them stay in business and need to basically rebrand themselves um, and do a whole lot of work in the background to try to build up the confidence in them again, that the public can have that confidence again. Yeah. And I, and I think there's some telltale signs that your company is heading for one of these company killers. Um, I think when you look at, you know, the stories of these companies, there's kind of... The, similar things that crop up again and again. Mm -hmm. I think the number one is leadership's approach to safety and quality. Um, It tends to be that the leadership is looking at cost performance measures, that they're putting costs and and performance above safety or quality. Mm -hmm. And you'll see it from, again, from a leadership level, a lot of times it's looking at all of their conversations are about shareholder price, EBIT, you know, EBIT for tag, all the all the different little financial things. They're very worried about the financials and not worried about that safety side or or you know their their reputation. Until the shareholders come after them for that part right. when the stock price drops. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think that's an important point you make, Alex, as far as what's projected out there in the industry or in the marketplace, difficulties they have in preventing these reoccurring problems yeah. that come up. And then of course the reputation they get uh, for folks that would be looking to work at that organization. They're no longer a, a place that's desired. No, to, to there's be supply. At. It's it's almost there's a, could almost be a shame element. Yeah, um, yeah with absolutely. some of these companies these days. Yeah. So, there's, there's but that. reoccurrent that that's probably key. People forgive um, pretty quickly after one or two things happen, but when things keep happening, they 
don't. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's forgiveness. I definitely don't. Because if you, you know, you look at the people in the Gulf that were affected by the BP oil spill, for example. That was massive. Those people aren't, haven't really forgiven. No. But there have been so many other problems or so many other, you know, news cycles of things to replace the outrage. So I don't necessarily know that these companies that have these massive disasters get forgiven, at least not by the local community. Exactly. But the memory fades. And I think, you know, if it if you see companies that survived it, a lot of them, like you said, they survived it by riding out that wave of outrage, mm -hmm. responding appropriately, hopefully, mm -hmm. Um, and and appropriately fixing their the, the mistake and their mess they made, but a lot of times it's it's a people just f lose track of the latest disaster. Well, you have different audiences. You have yeah. the general public, and then you have those directly impacted. Yeah. Um, and the directly impacted people <laughs> could also be shareholders. <laughs> by sure. the way. I mean, so and people start to understand too that if an organization culturally is reactive. Yeah to these reoccurring issues that come up time and time again, you know, that's very difficult mm -hmm. to create a, a good, healthy culture around. Well, I know lately we hear a lot of things going on in the airline industry, and but people even look for excuses for them as well, like the workforce because of COVID and things like that. And they lost a lot of the people who, you know, knew what they were doing and they have a lot of younger people in here trying to do these maintenance issues and stuff. So people, do try to understand as long as mm -hmm. progress is being made. Yeah, I, I don't always believe the, I won't call it the spin, but I don't always believe yeah. the, the, the company line on that. I can think of my time in quality and you can see the difference that one manager can have on a department, mm -hmm. one plant manager can have on a, on a facility and I, I think very much it's a reflection of leadership. There's a, a Taichi Ono quote, famous um, quality person. Um, his quote was, the shop floor is a reflection of leadership. And I think that is true from a plant level as well as from a company level. The leadership that drives these systems, you know, what they're focused on makes a difference. Uh, the BP oil mm -hmm. example uh, there's a famous quote of uh, no dry wells. Mm -hmm. So if you come to uh, one of Mark's talks, I, I think you probably find it on here um, in, in our list of him talking about conservative decision making. Mm -hmm. He goes through that BP oil disaster. And, you know, the, the philosophy of no dry wells, how that upper level leadership mindset goes down through the organization to affect the decisions that people make. So... Your leadership philosophy and how you approach operations. Well, we're not going to have a drive. We will, we will drill. We will dig. We will um, bore until we right. find something. Yeah. Even something if it's a little there. bit, <laughs> yep. the risks be darned, right? And so those kind of things led the company to taking more and more risk, mm -hmm. um, which allowed for disaster. And so again, I when you're looking for company killers looking for leadership's communication on risk, mm -hmm. looking for how leadership approaches risk and how they approach that that trickle down through the organization for its risk tolerance. So if your upper level leadership is being, you know, taking a lot of risk, which again, companies have to take mm -hmm. risk, right? That's where money is to be made at. Yes. There is a level of risk that you have to take. But how their approach to that risk can very much trickle down to the decision making of everyday people. And so, you know, it might be, I remember at facilities, there were conversations about, do we purchase these materials? Do we hold off on rebuilding things or doing certain types of maintenance mm -hmm. to, to mitigate costs before a, um, a quarter or a nearly, and luckily, we had strong leadership in my plant that was like, no, we're not going to mitigate costs just to make our numbers look a certain way. We're, we've got to make sure that our performance is consistent and that we're holding to our values. So again, I think that leadership element is really important. Yeah, you bring up a good point. Leadership being present and people seeing that. Mm -hmm. You know, Leadership actually being on the floor, walking around, asking questions, listening, mm -hmm. observing, what's going on, asking questions, what are people saying, and that can be, you use the term telltale, 
that can be a telltale for an organization, how involved they are, and that sets the tone for the people that are on the, if you if you will, the shop floor. Right. You know, what, regardless of whatever the venue is, the shop floor and people seeing that presence makes a big difference in hopefully mitigating some of these things that happen at a, at a company and making sure that it doesn't happen over and over and over again. I can see where, in dealing with some people in the past, different companies, where say you have a company that's trying to make changes and the leadership isn't actually involved and you can have one person that is stopping the whole program mm-hmm. that these other people want to have go forward. Mm-hmm. You can have one person yeah. that can just you know, be the roadblock for the improvement that everybody else is trying to do, yeah. which I feel like if their leadership was involved in this, then they would, they would get in there and push that on. They that person would know. I should probably get out of the way on this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let, in let a lot of organizations, there's yeah. these centers of influence. It could exactly. be a journeyman. It could be someone who's been there for a long, long time. Yeah. Who has real good tacit knowledge about things, but also has been involved in mm-hmm. kind of what the what the norm has you know evolved into. Not not necessarily wanting mm-hmm. something to happen. But just being conditioned, this is the way things are, and we don't want to really, you know, rock that cart too much. And then if we're getting an edict from leadership, like Alex mentioned, mm-hmm. okay, let's go, 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 mm-hmm. pressuring a system that's that's gonna that's gonna fail. They just don't know it's gonna fail. Well, and we we call it the two way street and taproot, which is you know when we're looking at a management system, it's leadership's responsibility for communicating vision and values. Right, leadership sets the these are our core principles. This is how we do business. This is the way we're going to do it. This is how we're going to achieve our results, right? That's leadership's vision. So they communicate that down through the organization. And there's a responsibility on the other side of that with employee communication. Employees have to feel you know, comfortable bringing up quality issues, bringing up safety concerns. Mm-hmm. And leadership has to communicate the value of that from employees, the value of that communication. And so that two-way street between leadership's communication of values and employees' communication of concerns is, again, it's another sign if you have a good, you know, and I I say open, and open means people actually Mm -hmm. bring up problems that are real, that are severe um, and significant. That's a good sign that you actually have a good communications uh, two-way street in your organization. What you don't want and what you almost always see before disaster is the opposite. You see leadership feels like they've communicated a vision that's good and clear Mm -hmm. and employees go, they never listen. I've told them in every single disaster, you all, there's always one person I told them about this. Right. right? And, and again, I'm thinking of the challenger disaster. There, there was a, a, a famous engineer that was, speaking and he said we should not launch he was adamant we should not launch and it went up and and leadership said no we're going to launch right so there was pressure all pressure. eyes were upon them yeah well it's usually the person that's closest to mm-hmm. the work that is that canary in the coal mine mm-hmm. yeah. right that it says that, you know, if you look at the the housing crisis mm-hmm. in 2008 um you know there were lots of analysts that looked at that and there were only a few that were so close to it when they looked how things were packaged and then that, you know when they when they saw how things were segmented within those packages that said you know something this doesn't look good i wouldn't bet on it i would bet against it right and this is going to fail no one wanted to hear about it no there was too much investment um, to alex's point before from leadership from the industry people were saying you're going to keep on growing you're going to find this. This is what we're. This is the way we're going to be doing this moving forward. Of course, the people that were closest to it said, "This is dangerous." I think you can almost guarantee that that's that's going to go wrong. Yeah. I remember just you bringing that up kind of reminded me. I mean, it's kind of a weird example, but years ago when I was taking my Series Seven um, uh, test mm-hmm. and learning all the basics of investments and financial and stuff, that was right before the tech bubble. Oh, and yeah. so the market was like going crazy. Well, if you listen to the people on television, those P ratios were, it was a new economy. 
Right. This was the way it was going to be. Yeah. And they would sit there and talk you all day long into feeling like it was okay. Right. It was not okay. Right. And the people, and that were, close going, to it, the I, people I, that were close to that work yeah. were saying, well, that's not really a new economy. That's, well, that's something that's it. probably going to fail. It's just a yeah. matter of time. I just learned yeah. the basics. Yeah. And you get away from the basics. And mm-hmm. the basics tend to be right. Yeah. Uh, usually. Always. Yeah. Always, yeah. And I sat there going, that's not what I just learned. That's not what I just learned. Mm-hmm. And whew, that was scary. Yeah. So that that's another example, too, of understanding the risk, the technical errors, and the issues that people are involving. So, you know, the example with the subprime mortgage mm-hmm. issue, right, there's a level of complexity and risk there that really was not well understood by the industry or not recognized, let's say, by the industry. And a lot of the people that were involved in it just thought this was how, this was all okay. Yeah. It's an acceptable level of risk. We're hoping for the best. Yeah. Well, it happens can't, all the time. Housing markets can't fall. Um, and so that understanding of risk is important. So just like in that industry, you look at other industries to look for where they had risk and how they mitigate it. And does your operations, does your field operations understand the mitigation and the safety margin that they're working in? And likewise, does leadership understand that safety margin? So how would you, companies going through this, how would you advise them into taking steps? If Say you're somebody in your company that sees the red flags. So, I think if you're at the bottom level, mm-hmm. it's it's a really you, you don't have much opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's hard. You bring up your concerns. Mm-hmm. If you see something, say something. That's that's a pretty clear thing. Mm-hmm. If you see somebody violating safety protocols, if you see somebody doing something unethical from a quality standpoint or operations or safety standpoint, report and bring it up. If you're in middle management, when you hear those concerns, respond to them. Don't brush them off. A lot of times I've seen managers get defensive. They want to defend that this is the way we do business. And uh, that's the wrong approach when it comes to, we'll say cheating or breaking rules or managing risk. If you can communicate the why this risk is acceptable, you know, I remember we used to do quality deviations, right? We're minorly outside of some spec Well, there's a process for that. It wasn't just me as a manager signing off, yep, that's okay, I'm just gonna ship on bad product. No, it was, is this product actually gonna produce a risk to the customer? Mm -hmm. If it is, we're not shipping it, we're scrapping it. If it's not, that's when again, you make those those calls based on your actual company's risk profile and is it actually gonna affect the customer or not? So a superficial surface thing, no, that's not going to affect the customer, it won't affect the product, it won't affect the lifetime, then we'll send that on. So again, middle management responding to those problems and then communicating up to leadership when you don't feel that leadership is setting the appropriate vision or values. Mm-hmm. So again, plant managers or the middle kind of, the people that turn vision into reality, right? That's the middle management group. Um, those people have to be able to speak up to their leadership as well when the concerning issues are affecting their goals, right? Mm-hmm. Your goal is to do all these things. No dry wells. Well, we're, we're going to have dry wells because right. there's some stuff that's not safe to do. You, you've got to be able to speak up to management. Leadership at the very top level, I think what they need to recognize is they need to recognize when they don't have technical expertise. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, people at the top part of companies, CEOs, C-suite, um, their degree might not be in engineering. Their degree might be in some other, and I, you know, I'm not just picking engineering, but they mm-hmm. might be in some other field because they sure. might be a finance guy, right. right? Their their goal is to be a finance and to make sure that the company makes money and they're making the shareholders happy. Well, and they <clears throat> pay people to do these things. You yeah, know, this. <laughs> well, Alex brings up a good point. Yeah. You know, for leadership, there's different languages within an organization. Mm-hmm. There's the people that are getting the work done. Mm-hmm. They have their own language that you know they can communicate to a plant manager. Mm-hmm. Look at what he's describing. Once you start getting above that, there's different languages and there's different ways that people are being measured on how a company's performing and what they're doing. But if you can create an uh, an open channel. 
um, of communication at you know at the where the work's being done to to leadership mm-hmm. um, it opens up a whole you know slew of opportunities one it gives you the opportunity to be proactive if you can go to the work and listen and watch and observe what's going on I mean there's a very famous electrical car manufacturer <laughs> nowadays and their CEO spends a lot of time in a plant mm-hmm. and there's a reason why you know that CEO listens goes yeah. there ask the question is this something that's a safety concern maybe um, if not let's put that aside um, is it something that's perceived value okay great let's you mm-hmm. know we've got a process for evaluating that but um, if, if you can if you can kind of open up that channel for communication that creates a situation where you can build a culture that's proactive you can build a culture that if that leader has gone to where the work's being done they can understand you know what we're doing here for example with the taproot I understand the value mm-hmm. of why we're doing this. I understand this capacity that we're we're building with these resources that understand the system and how it can can apply it mm-hmm. in a, in a proactive manner. So I think you know that's a that's one way that you can kind of improve the circumstances and also mitigate the risk of a company killer series yeah. of events that you know once it gets to the the national stage or the international mm-hmm. stage it's very hard to repackage that back. Well, I want to, I want to be clear on one thing, too, because I, I, I don't want to let the C-suite off the fire for a moment. <laughs> well, I want to make we sure said we one time, they're the people whose name's going to be yeah. in the headlines. <laughs> yeah. so, <laughs> These things happen. So I, I don't just because you go and have your walks and talks, you've got to make sure that you're a technical expert as well. So. You know, I think next week you're talking with Mark about high reliability mm-hmm. organizations, um, or an upcoming one shortly. Um, one of the things that makes Rick over such an interesting person to to learn about was when you look at the nuclear, um, the the naval nuke program. Rick over was a technical expert. He understood nuclear reactors mm-hmm. and nuclear safety how many C-suite level people really have a technical understanding Small of, percentage. of yeah. their you know, complex processes. And so as a leader, there is a responsibility and a requirement that you are an expert in the risks of your industry. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's oftentimes missed um, I had a conversation with a CEO at one of our um, summits that came to our, our conference, and I was doing a talk on conservative decision making. And he attended the talk, and he said something that stood out for him that made him, you know, at first hesitant to this idea. He was like, "Well, no, you've got to take risks. That's how you make money in industry is taking risks." And he's and he said, "Well, he thought about it a little bit more, and he recognized, well, you know." The, uh, and the nuclear Navy was a risk. Nobody had ever turned a nuclear bomb into a process for producing clean power. Right. That hadn't been done before. Yeah. That is a risk. So when you think of industries, um, you know, Apple with Steve Jobs, he was a technical expert. Now, he may not have been the programmer. He may not have been the, the lead designer, but he was an expert mm-hmm. in what, the technical side of what people wanted, what the interface should be like, um, and he had a clear vision. And so that connection between expertise and vision and risk, all of those elements come together. And you see a lot of the times where you have these industries where the company has perhaps gone away from having leadership with a technical expertise, Mm -hmm. you often see disaster and you often see repeat failures on a company level yeah i mean you brought up the dot-com era Mm -hmm. right you know early early in my life i was i I worked with oracle and larry ellison the ceo he was in the trenches he did Mm -hmm. the work he's he's, he was what alex is is describing he understood the inner workings of of technology databases applications how things work together why they work together and more importantly how we grew the company to this day is understanding kind of that end-to-end integration, the applications that have to ride on top of it, and then the risks of not doing that. So he, he knew, he, he yeah. engineer, he's an engineer, he was an engineer. 
but uh, that's a that's a good example that you bring up. Well, and then that having that knowledge is going to gain you so much more respect mm-hmm. from all of the people who are working for you yeah. and with you on your projects and your company goals. If they don't think you know what you're talking about, yeah. they'll be like, okay. <laughs> there's there's, some, <laughs> you know? anom- there's I mean, some anomalies to it. There there's, you know, there's, but if you're coming down, you know, yeah. telling people how to do their job and you have no idea yeah. what is even going on, yeah. um, there's some of that out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, think, you think of IBM <laughs> yeah. and Lou Gerstner when he took over. What did Lou do? He made cookies. Yeah. But then he was the CEO of, of Nabisco, and he asked questions like, why do we do this? But he did go to the work. But that, to Alex's point, yeah. that's kind of an anomaly. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. You know, every single conversation, it seems like we get in here on, it all comes down to leadership. Mm -hmm. Almost, I'd say 90% of our conversations, that's where we keep coming back to um, what, where do you start um, to improve a company? Yeah. And that's the, that's the place. So what would be some advice you all have for leadership? So the first thing that I would say is, and this is a, the, you know, kind of a fundamental element when it comes to high reliability. So maybe listen more on Mark because he'll talk about this more. But it's err on the side of safety, mm-hmm. err on the side of quality. When you're making decisions, when you're making you know communications to your employees, communicate the the decisions that you want them to make. So if you're wanting them to err on the side of safety, Mm -hmm. when you're talking about production goals, don't just talk about the the production. Talk about what you want to see from a safety standpoint. Talk about what you want to see from a safeguarding standpoint, Mm -hmm. right? What's your margins that you want people operating in? And so that, that first level of, you know, speak about it, but then also demonstrate what you care about. Mm -hmm. So, as a leader, you've got to demonstrate what you care about, which means if I'm going to go to a facility, do those walks, I'm not just going to ask about production questions or quality questions. I'm going to ask about safety questions. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask about quality. I'm going to ask about defects and what happens when you have a problem. Who do you go to? I'm going to ask those kind of questions that see how people communicate problems and are those problems being mm-hmm. addressed. That's what I'm going to look for as a leader who's looking to prevent company killer Mm -hmm. type uh, incidents. Absolutely. Those are great tips. Rick? Well, when when you mention that, what comes to mind is I remember years ago being in the the North Sea Mm -hmm. uh, with an oil company and and leadership was present at at the time that I Mm -hmm. was there. And everyone was, was very, very mindful of kind of following protocol because that it was so ingrained mm-hmm. in their culture. Right down to when we came back to corporate, even within that corporate building, whether leadership was present at that given moment, right. you know, the importance of holding a railing, going down a set of stairs. Sure. And full well knowing that if you were observed not doing that, it was, you know, zero strikes. You know, you that was a bad yeah. thing, but it set a culture and leadership set set that culture. Frankly, I felt very safe, you know, at at that company. You know, whether I was in an office, uh, on a platform, or or and around any of their assets, frankly. But um, I think it's a good point that you make. Well, and if there's companies out there that would like some help with these concepts that we're talking about, uh, we do have some tools that can can help you. Um, you work on a great, actually two great. Uh, courses stopping human error and the executive leadership courses yeah we talk about conservative decision making in both of those courses Um, in the the leadership course we do it more from speaking to leaders about how they can get their organization to be more um, in line with the conservative decision making Mm -hmm. philosophy to prevent those company killers and what their responsibility is as leaders in our human error course we talk about how um, conservative decision making uh, can affect not just the decisions that leaders make, but also the decisions that your design groups, your engineering, and your operations groups make, and how that trickles into the organization to increase mm-hmm. error rate and make people more likely to make mistakes. So both of those um, courses are kind of designed for different groups, right. and I think it's critical to speak to leadership about this, and I think it's also critical to speak to um, management, middle management, people that are involved mm-hmm. in 
your improvement programs about this topic and how to prevent these company killers. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Well, we would love to help you with these type of things. If this interests you, you are more than welcome to reach out to us. Uh, we go to our website, taproot.com. There's so much information on there. On our blog, sign up for our newsletter because this type of information is, it goes out daily. Uh, it's there's constantly something of value for you you can get on there and get great information for free or we are happy to help you uh, we have these courses that we can do like the leadership we can do on site or we can do it virtually uh, we know everybody's really busy <laughs> but we can do those types of things for you so just reach out to us uh, you can reach out to me Alex Rick we have a whole team here ready to help you we can discuss what your issues at your company might be or your goals might be and how Tapri could possibly help you with these so guys um, very interesting conversation as always uh, we always get started in these and never know where we're gonna go it's, <laughs> all, it's right. always an interesting Thanks road. For inviting Thank you. And, and don't forget to subscribe and click the little notification icon. What did it used to be? The dingly something? <laughs> that's the doobly doop. Doobly that's where the in, that's the that's where all the information's down in the doobly doop. <laughs> that was it. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you back here next time. <laughs>